One of the first steps in designing a hardware implementation is to transform it from a systems level simulation to a simulation that is corresponding to the final hardware. So if we take a look at uh, the design flow, which we will be uh, considering in detail uh, in upcoming videos, it starts with a high level model. And this high level model is usually performed by a systems engineer, by someone who is involved in the application we want to move into hardware. So if we are talking about a chip that performs video compression, for example, then it's someone who is uh, specialized in uh, video compression algorithms. If we're talking about a security algorithm, it's someone who is uh, involved in uh, encryption and decryption and cryptography. So this is a, a simulation that is performed by someone who is more um, concerned with the application, with the trade-offs involved in the application than with hardware on, or how this application would actually be implemented. So these simulations, these very high level simulations are usually performed using floating point simulators. So we're talking about software simulators like um, C or MATLAB or something uh, similar, which can allow someone to do quickly prototype an algorithm uh, and understand the trade-offs that uh, happen within this algorithm. So floating point numbers, um, they take a, a, a register, and so if you have like, for example, a 64 bit register, and then you divide this register into three components, a significant, a base and an exponent. And so the number is represented as shown above uh, the register and each of these components will take part of the register. The good thing about floating point representation of numbers is that it allows you to represent a huge range of numbers. So this is basically due to the fact that we have an exponent here. This is what allows us to have a large uh, range of numbers. Uh, without much loss of generality, let's assume that we have an exponent uh, uh, of 12 bits and that we are only representing uh, positive numbers. So we have numbers from uh, an exponent of zero, which means we multiply by one, to an exponent of two to the power of 12. That's a very large um, range of numbers. So um, this is the main advantage of floating point numbers. If you can also uh, imagine exponents being negative, then they have the ability to represent really small numbers and really large numbers. So floating point numbers are usually associated with general purpose processors and uh, really large registers, which, uh, which is why they're also associated with um, a large range of numbers. So if you use a um, high level simulator, it's usually gonna be running on a general purpose processor with a, uh, an operating system, and it's gonna use floating point registers to represent numbers uh, from the very small to the very large. The problem with floating point numbers is that floating point operations are slow, particularly addition is slow. And so floating point processing units are not very efficient, uh, they also have to deal with very large registers, which increases the inefficiency because as, uh, as we will see, arithmetic circuits get much slow, slower when the word length increases. And they're also associated with systems with uh, cumbersome operating systems. When we uh, talk about ASIC implementations or even FPGA implementations, any implementation that is um, very hardware specific, we are mostly talking about implementations that use fixed point numbers. And so the first step in, in the design flow is uh, to transfer the high level model into a fixed point model. Uh, and so we're taking care of moving floating point numbers into fixed point numbers. We are taking care of moving basically the infinite word length that we have available, which is, you know, uh, more or less true, it's basically an infinite word length that we have available in floating point processors to a finite word length in hardware. So when we move the numbers to fixed point registers, we're also going to transform all operations, additions and multiplications and so on into fixed point multiplications. This will incur a penalty because 
we are reducing the available width in all the registers and this penalty has to be taken into consideration. This is basically what happens in the fixed point simulation. We are simulating the system again using fixed point numbers and fixed point operations so that we understand the impact of quantizing uh, the registers in which numbers are put. So the first step here is to understand how fixed point numbers work. And uh, the thing about a floating point register is that the position of the binary point is floating. It is determined by the exponent and it could move to allow us to represent huge numbers or very small numbers. In a fixed point register, the position of the binary point is fixed. And so the width of the register could be small or large, but what's happening is that the fractional part and the integer part are uh, of fixed length. And so the range of numbers that we can rep uh, reproduce using a fixed point register is usually much smaller than a floating point register of corresponding length, but adders made for fixed point numbers are more efficient than those made for floating point numbers. So um, in this case, we are seeing a, an 8-bit an register, which consists of a 6-integer uh, bit and two fractional bits. And the position of the binary point is going to be fixed. For all numbers and for all operators, we have to know where the binary point is so that we can do things properly. There is one way to conceptualize or just look at fixed point numbers that is uh, very helpful when you try to uh, simulate fixed point uh, processing and you don't have a fixed point uh, simulator available. You just have a floating point simulator and you want it to force you want to force it to work as a fixed point simulator. Um, most high level simulators have fixed point uh, toolboxes that you can use to perform fixed point simulation, but I'm just going to introduce a very simple way to do this, which is also intuitive and shows us some insight. And in this method, we are going to represent fixed point numbers as pure integers, which means that we assume that the position of the binary point is to the extreme right. It's right of the uh, least significant bit. And there's no loss of generality here because the position of the binary point actually affects the number stored in the register only by a shift. And so if we look at the operations happening in this table, 13 plus 11 equals 24. This is equivalent to adding these two integer numbers to get this integer number. But this is also the same as 6.5 plus 5.5 equaling 12. And we perform the same operation to get the same result. And all that's happening when we move from uh, one row to the next in this table is that we are just moving the position of the binary point to the left. And so the position of the binary point just determines the scale in which our numbers uh, happen to be. And so you can assume uh, during the simulation that the numbers are purely integer, but then at the end, divide by a scale to get the correct position of your binary point and still have fixed point numbers. So there's no loss of generality in using this method. And, you know, Using this method, let's just try to uh, generate a fixed point number and store it in a register that is p bits long. So we have a register that is p bits long. Uh, the, the, the good thing about this method is that it allows us to uh, use flooring operations so that we can get fixed point numbers out of floating point uh, uh, systems. And so let's assume, for example, that we generate a random number uh, and store it in variable a. This random number is going to belong to the range uh, 0 to 1. And it's going to be uniformly distributed and drawn from this distribution. So it is a purely fractional number and it's represented uh, in a floating point processor, usually in 64 bits. And so it's going to have a very, very large um, number of, de of decimal uh, digits in it. Now, uh, we're going to multiply this number by 2 to the power of uh, p minus 1. And this changes the range of the number so that it now belongs to the range 0 to 2 to the power of p minus 1. Again, here we are actually dealing with unsigned numbers, but, you know, uh, modifying this to deal with signed numbers is going to be trivial. Uh, this number is still a floating point number. It contains a, an integer part and a very long fractional part. But if we perform a flooring operation here, 
we get rid of all the fractional part of a and we end up with a purely integer part and that integer will, will belong to the range 0 to 2 to the power of p minus 1 which means that it could be stored in a p in a, in a register of length p and so uh, this allows us to generate a number that is effectively stored in a register of a specific length so in the first step we generate a purely fractional number in the second step this number is still floating point but it contains an integer part that could be stored in a p-bit fixed point register in the third step we get rid of the fractional part so that we end up with only the integer part which could be stored in the register